All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Easter and welcome to this week in Missouri politics. This week uh, began the beginning of the second half of the Le Missouri legislative session and we're joined this week to talk about it by Speaker of the Missouri House, John Deal. Good. Mr. Speaker, welcome and uh, happy Easter. Hey, good. Thanks for having me back. You have been a busy man this year, uh, but one of the most productive first halves of session ever. Was it a strategy to pack so much in the first half? It, it was. I think one of the, the, the issues that we always run into is try to get too much done at the end. And, and when that happens, mistakes get made, things get held hostage and get jammed up in the process. So, so we had a pretty coordinated game plan from the beginning to start trying to move our priorities in the House early, and we've been pretty successful in doing that. Including the state budget will be done earlier than it's normally ever been done. Right, it's certainly tracking on that. So constitutionally this year we have to have the state budget done by May 8th. Uh, we wanted to try to get done a few weeks earlier so we can try to resolve any differences with the governor while we're still in session. So the way the Constitution is, if we get the budget to him about two weeks earlier than we typically do, <clears throat> we can deal with any disagreements through the veto process and, and override or work it out with the governor while we're still in session. So, And that's important because a large part of what we fund are, are schools and universities, uh, agencies that provide help and assistance to the most vulnerable in our society. And too often over the past couple of years, they've had to go four, five months after we pass a budget to really know sure. what their planning is going to be for the next year for them. And, and so, so what we're trying to do is get is to bring some certainty to the process and try to get this done a lot quicker. Is, is one of the reasons you decided to do it this way, this governor is roundly criticized by members of his own party, maybe loudest, for not engaging with the legislature. This way, it almost has to, right? Well, you, you do have to, and also, too, it's been no secret. I think the governor would probably admit it that they've used the budget as, as a weapon or a tool to try to leverage other policy discussions. So, so the earlier we can get the budget done in the process, the less that will be able to be utilized as, as a weapon or tool to try to leverage other policy discussion vetoes. So, so, so once again, if we can get this thing done in the next two weeks or so, uh, we can override him while we're still in session. What's interesting, too, is that an override of a budget item, an appropriation item, while we're still in session only requires a 50% plus one versus a two-thirds. I think that's a uh, public policy uh, point that is widely unknown in Jefferson City. Right. Well, it's never been done. <laughs> so so I think that's, you know, we're going to kind of get somewhat into uncharted territory. Here. But we're, we're tracking well. The House got the budget done about three weeks earlier than we typically did. I believe the uh, Senate version of the budget passed out of Senate appropriations uh, yesterday and will be ready for floor action next week. And if they can get it out of the Senate uh, next week, uh, off the floor of the Senate and back to the House to get in conference to resolve our differences, we, we should be on track. How close are you keeping track of those differences? Uh, you know, somewhat. I mean, I, I like to respect the process of both sure. bodies. So the House has its, you know, there's a pretty well-established protocol. The House goes first on budget items and we have and you our, have an experienced chairman for the budget this year and correct. Representative Flanagan both and, and as as is on the Senate side with with uh, Senator Schaefer who's chair of appropriations over there so that they they communicate well staff communicates well yet nevertheless there are going to be differences in priorities between what the Senate wants and what the House does and but I think they're good faith differences and I think 
both sides will come together to, to, to get a document that works and to the governor's desk. So uh, coming out of spring break, you talked about one of the issues that's been most discussed, and that was municipal court reform. Correct. Can you kind of outline for us what is your take on the court reform and what is your plan to move forward? Right. And, and this is, you know, the, what, we, what we're going to try to do on court reform is, is really consistent with what I talked about on the show several weeks ago at the beginning of session. So we're going to look at systemic issues uh, that we can use to make our, our state, in particular some of the underserved and, and, and underprivileged areas better. And that's education reform, and we've passed a very good transfer bill and sent that over to the Senate. It's creating a regulatory and business environment where businesses want to grow. The third component of this is what's the relationship of the citizens to its government? Okay, and government shouldn't exist for the purpose of finding its citizens to collect revenue in order for the government to survive. So, so what we've done is we've taken a look at some of these practices. I don't think it's any secret with people that live in this area that there are municipalities that exist solely because <clears throat> they happen to be fortunate enough to have 700 yards of interstate, for example, go through, go through their city. And they run out and they run speed traps to collect there revenue. There are these full municipalities and rural areas too that are just basically live to provide government jobs. C correct. I mean, this is a problem. So in St. Louis County alone, our numbers show that there are 453,000 outstanding minor traffic warrants for a population of 950,000 people. Across the state, there's 1.2 million. So what we've done is really taken a look at some of the practices of these municipalities. And really one of the more, more egregious things are that, 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 that if, you, if you get a speeding ticket, okay, and you can't show up that night because you have a job or whatever, you, you should be held accountable for that speeding ticket. You should have a warrant issued if you haven't disposed of it. But often you can't pay for it by mail and often you can't pay for it electronically online. You're forced to show up in courtrooms that often aren't big enough to hold everybody that's there that night, so it gets carried over for another night, another night after that. If you happen to miss one of those, you then get another charge issued against you called a failure to appear charge with another warrant. So effectively your fine ends up doubling and tripling over what your original traffic ticket was. And you still cannot pay those by mail or electronically. So things start piling on. So what we're doing is saying you have to be held. There's no doubt you have to be held accountable for what you've been charged with. How did it okay. get so bad? Well, because government is always looking for additional sources <laughs> of revenue. I mean, we, we never hear government voluntarily saying I want to get smaller. Sure. Okay. Or, or the bureaucracy not wanting to, to continue to, 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 to invest in itself. So, so every now and then we've got to take, you know, we got to take a step back and say how should this be run? And it's really I think common sense. If you get a ticket, you need to be held accountable for that ticket. If you don't address it, you'll have a warrant issued for your arrest. But you should be able to pay that ticket by mail. You should be able to pay it electronically. If you're forced to come to court, that courtroom should be big enough to accommodate everybody who's been asked to appear that night and not make people stand out in parking lots and other things wondering with it, when and if they're going to get called. So, so Public safety is important, and, 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 and to the extent tickets are issued for public safety, that's sure. going to continue to occur to the extent there's a system or a cycle that's created just to generate revenue to keep cities afloat, we're going to put an end to that. After watching your press conference, one former senator said, told us that this, if, if your plan was enacted, it would probably be the thing that actually cut government more than anything since the Hancock Amendment. Well, we're going to try. I mean, look, at the, 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 there's no doubt that, that, that there are numerous small entities and small governments and maybe even some bigger ones that we'll learn about that, that exist solely off this type of revenue. And that's not a reason a government should exist. A government should exist to, to provide public safety for its residents and it should exist to provide basic government services which are funded by the residents. Even those that care about local control, I think could see that there is a point where the larger entity has to step in when there's just egregious, you know, harassment and persecution of its citizens. I, some people say, well, they want bigger speed traps or more money. What is the argument for having more of this harassment? 
Well, I, I, I don't think there's a real coincidence. Now, uh, keep in mind, I mean, there are some legitimate reasons to patrol interstates and to pull people over. People do speed. There are DWIs, okay? You know, in high traffic and high collision areas, I, I think it's appropriate to do that. And this bill does absolutely nothing to stop legitimate policing tactics. But 10% is 20%. Where I, I, is the mat? Where is that number that it becomes you're just collecting money? Well, that, that's something we're going to be looking at into our hearings. I don't know exactly where the percentages are going to come down yet, but I think we're more concerned about the actual practices and purposes sure. behind it. Seems like St. Ann wasn't as worried about that little strip of interstate when they had a mall. When the mall went away, they became extremely interested in that little bitty strip of interest. Right. In public safety became a huge priority. Right, yeah. And, and, but then there are other cities where they do legitimately need sure. to patrol the highway. So, um, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a push and pull. This bill's not going to be perfect. It's not going to solve every problem that exists out there. But I think we are going to try to break the cycle of using the collection of fines under the threat of warrant to continue a cycle of piling on and piling on where we get to the point where we have virtually one warrant for every two citizens <laughs> in this county. You've been known as the father of the tax cut that was passed last year, probably the first major tax cut since the Republicans took the majority. The first major tax cut in 100 years. Is it on track to being implemented? Where is that? When right. will people see less of their money gone to the government? Correct. S starting next fiscal year, the okay. triggers will start. So is I think it's on track. track. We're track. Our, our revenue numbers will, will you know, continue to rise. And I, I think... I think once you see the tax cut enacted, it's going to create and encourage an environment that will foster more economic activity and you'll see our revenues continue to rise in the state. You've seen in Kansas that lag, there's been a lag there. Some people have criticized right. between the benefit and you know implementing it. You think the way you've done it in Missouri won't face such a lag? Well, what well, we've strategy? done, first of all, the, the tax cut we did in Missouri is while it's a tax cut, sure. the way it's implemented and structured is substantially different than what was done in Kansas. Any chance to increase the size so, of Missouri's while you're speaking? I think there's some folks who are talking about it. So we're going to see what the phase-in looks like next year. And if there's an opportunity to cut taxes more, we're going to do that. One of the things we are going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks, and this kind of falls into our theme before, how government keeps looking for more money, is that over the past several years, our Department of Revenue has started interpreting our existing tax code differently and charging businesses and individuals <laughs> for taxes that they've never been charged for before. And so we're going to be looking at a series of bills over the next couple of weeks. They're going to roll back those hidden tax increases on Missouri businesses and, and the Missouri residents to bring it back to what the true intent of the well, statute is. So there's was. never been a government that didn't want more money? Government always wants more money. We know that for sure. Um, on, a, on a more sensitive note, You've been an active Republican since morning in America, since Ronald Reagan. And Long time ago. I remember a picture of you in a Fritz Busters t-shirt that, that the yeah, Missouri Times ran. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Republican Party's had some somber weeks the last uh, this spring and late winter. Um, you're a leader in the party. You've been around it for a long time. People look up to you. What, what is something you could say right now in, a, in a, kind of an emotional, uncertain time? What, how do you, what, are the, what are the things you say to people to to kind of move forward and look for a better time and maybe even a better politics. Right. I mean, you know, first, I mean, what happened is just an un unspeakable tragedy. You know, the auditor and I <clears throat> had, a, sure. had a good working relationship. Um, and, and, and really, it's, it's just a deeply, deeply personal tragedy. I've personally tried to not interject myself as a politician into a tragedy that affects him and his family. Uh, but I, mean, I think going forward, on this, I still think the elections in 2016 are going to be about the future and direction of the state. And, you know, Missouri is uniquely positioned in the country. We're bordered by most of our economy and most of our commerce in the state are bordered by other states. And so we essentially become a laboratory. And if you think around the state from St. Louis, just go around the border. Most of our commerce is within about a half an hour to 45 minute drive of another state. And, and so we as a state have to decide, are we going to be with the states that are growing like Tennessee and Arkansas and Oklahoma, or are we going to be like Illinois? And, and, and wh whether it comes to labor policy, tax policy, regulatory environment, a generally friendly environment for people to grow 
their jobs and to relocate here. So I think that's what the 2016 elections are going to be about. It's going to be about the direction, about the direction. I mean, I would certainly agree with you. But do you think, just as far as the the inside community, probably the people watching this show, I would say as long as voters respond to negative campaigns, it's always been my thought that if a half hour address on energy policy was what the polling showed a candidate should do, they'd rather do that. Correct. But just like if you were selling coffee mugs, if your market research told you another thing would be successful, that's what you'd probably do. Editorial writers, they, I have, I, I could tell you. They're some of the most negative people out there. Analytics right. show right. the bombastic negative ones get more clicks than a right. lengthy policy one. Correct. So which one do you see more of? Right. You're a conservative Republican, which means you get the heaviest criticism by the mm -hmm. media. Do you think sometimes in the media they forget these are real people? Oh, I, I, I think so. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, I, I personally expect it. So, uh, and, and I think part of being a leader and part of the way I try to govern in the House is to look past all the chatter. Okay, we have some clear policy objectives we want to accomplish, and, and I don't allow myself to get distracted by the chatter or some of the negative comments that are made. I suppose you can't be the father of Missouri's first tax cut and expect to be loved by the Post-Dispatch editorial board at well, the same correct. time. Or, or what, whatever the litany of whether it's labor policy, business regulatory reform, or a whole array of other things that, that we do. Like, for example, trying to rein in some of these fines. One of the criticisms that I've heard of one of the editorial boards is that, well, next the cities are just going to, you haven't solved the problem, then they'll start just trying to find people for tall grass and windows, so you haven't solved the problem. Well, look, you, you can only address the situation that that's in front of you. And, 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 and there's always reasons why you shouldn't do something. And, and, and if, you, if you focus on that and you focus on the negativity, you can't stay focused on what your agenda is and what you can accomplish. And that's what we're trying to do in the Missouri House. Mr. Speaker, thank you for joining us. And we'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Welcome back to This Week in Missouri Politics. We are now joined by our opinion maker panel, starting with a uh, representative and the man I came to know as Mayor, Joe Adams, here in University City. New representative, rising star in the Republican Party, John Weeman out of St. Charles County. And speaking of rising stars, one of the hottest young Democrat consultants coming off some wins last fall, Braxton Payne with Show Me Victories. And Republican stalwart, longtime activist, dean of the party, uh, Jack Spooner. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Spooner, uh, welcome. We'll start with you. What did you think of the speaker's comments on municipal court reform? Well, I liked them. Um, I liked them. I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the government telling municipalities how they should run, and I think that there's some other checks that they can put in the place that may be better than, than Jeff City telling St. Anne or Ferguson what they need to be doing. Like what? Well, if you take a ticket revenue at a certain level, and once that level's hit, you can say that those traffic tickets are no longer actionable as uh, warrants. Uh, you can't arrest on them. They become parking tickets that someone has to accrue a certain amount of those tickets before they become warrants. Uh, that they, they can't increase the fines and that they have to have a set fine. Why not do it all? Cut all the governments you can cut and then keep cutting, right? Well, you know, it's, uh, it, the municipalities can run themselves, but if they get out of hand, government can kind of hold them in check, but to tell them how many tickets they can run, or can write or shouldn't write, uh, I don't know that that's uh, the absolutely best way of doing it. Representative, Mr. Mayor, you've ran a city. Uh, you know what this revenue is like. You know what the services they provide. What's your take? Well, in a sense, I agree with the attorney over here in that you really can't set this as a limit. And they got that Max Creek law, but they never defined everything. And they've never made sure it really works before. And they're now they're trying to change it before they see if it worked. 
But I think, would you, do you believe the Max Creek law is working? I mean, is there, is there a way to enforce the law that exists? Well, that probably is the problem because they didn't define everything. And that's what they should do is define it, then see if it works. And if it doesn't work, then come back and make some changes. Rex, what's the politics of this? You know, I, don't, I honestly don't think we know enough yet. I think what Better Together is doing is really good, and I think we need to continue to really study, you know, what these municipalities mean to the people. I think we do have too many. I think when you drive up 170 and you hit, you know, five or six different municipalities, and you're, you know, if you are speeding, you know, if even if you're going five miles per hour in one municipality and you're going seven over in another, you know, what exactly can we have some uh, uniform laws? I think it's really what we need. Does government serve the purpose of just providing jobs? Uh, these people are out fundraising to pay themselves to, fun, to go fundraise. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the purpose of government. I think it's to serve the people. And doesn't it, doesn't it hurt all government when you have such egregious policies that make people disrespect the most basic parts of it? Yeah, I mean, you, you saw it. You saw it in North County. I think sure. you see a, a big backlash against government. And I think, you know, government can do a lot of good things, but I think, you know, traffic fines are not one of them. Representative Weeming, St. Charles County, you have <coughs> fundraisers in Forestell on both ends collecting all the money they can get. Will this bill pass and put a stop to that? Well, it's certainly put a big dent on their uh, revenue stream. I would say uh, Forestell is one of the, the big abusers in that area. And, that, and I think that's the point to make out is that, you know, from a, a spreadsheet that I saw recently showed all the municipalities and showed all the, the revenue source that they had received from, from traffic violations. And it really what I noticed was that there was just a few bad actors, St. Anne, Forestell, you know, other small communities. I think that's a problem, too. We have a lot of small communities that rely on that as a revenue source. So I think we just need to come up with a solution that doesn't necessarily impact them dr dramatically. I have a city in my own district that is, I think they were at 17% uh, on, their, on their revenue that comes from that. And, and I talked to the mayor and he said, you know, if we take away that completely as a revenue source, that costs about $100,000 to our city. And so I think we but need to- But it would refund $100,000 back to Missourians. It would, it would, but, but they'd have to find $100,000 somewhere else to be able to provide a police protection in, 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 in that community. If this bill passes, do you think these municipalities will go to their citizens and say, these are the services we provide, here's the revenues that to be made up, would you pay these taxes? Do you think they would pay them? Or would they cut government? <clears throat> they certainly would have to cut government, I would think, first, and then they, more than likely, if we know anything, they're going to go to their, their citizens and say, hey, we, we've got to cut back and... and if you want these services, then we're going to have to raise uh, our fees or our taxes to do that. Representative Adams, there was a press conference this week with Jeff Mazur with AFSCME and Jay Barr and Jamil Nasheed, several others, talking about in public employee salaries, kind of going back to the revenue side of this. Right. They pointed out Missouri is at the bottom of in public employee salaries. That is correct. And the turnover was very high. Correct. How do you fix this problem? Well, one way you can fix the problem is not continually to shrink the size of Missouri state government without coming up with revenue sources to pay the employees. We need to play, pay the employees of this state a living wage, and we're not doing that. I had a friend who is now retired from the state, but he worked many years, and there were a number of years he did not get a raise, and he did dangerous work out there on the highways. Representative Weeman, I'm sure you saw parts of the story about this. Um, you're in business, you manage employees, is the turnover rate alarming to you and is this a problem that is on the radar now? In the business world, in the real world, you, you certainly don't, don't want a high turnover rate in your employees. That, that's not a good thing. Uh, you're always going to have a certain amount of turnover and that's, that's normal, that's expected and, and actually it's, in some cases it's healthy to have turnover rate. But I, I would agree that you know, you need, we need to take steps to make sure that we don't have a, an inordinate amount of turnover in, in employees and, and, and that you, know, you have to look at a lot of things besides just what we're paying them. It could be working conditions. It could be, you know, there's other factors besides pay that, that affect someone's desire to want to continue to work in the, in the position that they're in. Jack Spooner, what do you think? I mean, is this a problem you can solve? And how you're, you're in business, how, how do you solve a problem like this that's gotten this bad? Well, in government, it's different than business, and that's part of the problem. First of all, I don't know where the turnover is occurring. Is it occurring in the clerical positions? for the lower paying positions, is it occurring the mid-level, higher positions? Government needs to shrink. Government needs to become more efficient. And to do that, you gotta go to each agency, each entity, do zero-based auditing, where you start them off at zero and you see what value you're getting for your dollar. And then you start cutting there. You put your money where you have value. 
If you have turnover, you're eight dollar an hour people. That's fine. I don't have to train them. But I don't want my heads of my departments leaving every year and losing the continuity because that's costing me more than just the loss in the salary just to retrain. So you got to look at the entire picture. Government has got to become more efficient and more corporate minded. Braxton, was it, how important was it that a very well respected Republican, Jay Barnes, was leading this fight? I know he represents Jeff City, but. He is respected and he's extremely thoughtful. You know, Democrats can't really get much done in Missouri. So when you do have a Republican, you know, that really supports your fight, I think that's a positive thing. But as, you know, I don't like being last. And I think Missouri's 50 out of 50 in employee pay. And I really think we should, we should raise it. But in all fairness, what, 20 of the last 24 years will have been under Democrat governors? Yeah, and I, I think, but I think we've had a Republican legislature. And I think that now we really do need to raise it. I mean, I think with 39000 you know, Arkansas is ahead of us, you know, $2,300 around us. That is a, that is a hurtful I, statistic. I, I, I mean, I, mean I, I just don't like to be last. And I really think we need to, we really need to raise it. They deserve a pay raise. You know, like he said, you know, we really need a living wage in Missouri. This is a problem that's going to take a few years to fix. I mean, we probably didn't get here overnight. Oh, definitely no. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, we did when I was mayor of University City, we surveyed all of the surrounding cities that were more or less equal to us and we tried to make sure we were somewhere in that middle to upper third in pay for our employees to make sure we maintain and kept the best employees to do the best service and we still had problems losing some of our employees to some of the other cities. And closing on uh, some of the comments the speaker made, tough time in the Republican Party, been a, been a tough couple weeks losing Spence Jackson, obviously Otter Schweik. Um, Representative, you've been in the party a long time, worked for uh, now Senator Blunt when he was Secretary of State. What is the, what is the mood and, and how, do, how do Republicans start to move forward to where it's a better day? The passing of, of Tom Swike was, was devastating uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, not, not only to his family and, but to the rest of it, his organization and the party. But then now having uh, Spence Jackson um, pass away, that was a, it just in a close proximity. I think it's just going to take time for the, the sure. wounds to, to heal. And, and I know there are many people within the party that are trying their best to try to do, mend the fences, try to uh, get back focused on what our goal is, and that is to elect a, a good person to, to be uh, running for our statewide offices. Jack, you've been involved in a long time. Now you're very involved with the state party. Um, what do you say to younger folks? Well, you know, there is Stafford. an excellent article written by Carl Rove about uh, how many conservatives we have and if they all come out and vote and what the party can do and simply the conservatives have got to accept and include the moderates. We have to start working together and people have to start wor w realizing that we can s share the same principles and values and priorities but we may have to do different things to get some things done without compromising those principles. Sure. So once the conservative side understands it and the moderate side is, is given a little more um, let, let in a little bit more. I think the younger people and the minorities, and you'll have a little more outreach. And that kind of leads to um, a statement I wanted to make at the end of the program here. Uh, this uh, week we lost uh, Spence Jackson, a uh, rep longtime Republican operative and a very good friend of mine, a tremendous person that gave a lot to the state. And on this Easter Sunday, we want to know that uh, him and his family are in our thoughts and prayers. And we'll see you next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. Mm -hmm.